But again, when we talk about disbeliefs, can we say that all non-Muslims who reject Islam or who do not or die as non-Muslims are disbelievers? Again, we have to be precise. Because in the English language, some Muslims may not pay attention to these subtle differences. There is a difference between non-believer and disbeliever. You can guess what's the difference here. A non-believer is somebody who does not believe in something. But he may, may have never heard of that something. You see? There are people like the ulama called Ahlul Fatra. People who never heard of a message of any prophet and before the coming of any prophet. They never heard. They died without the correct belief. Are they to be punished? Ahl al-Fatra? There is a big question mark. It's not automatic really. These people are called more correctly non-believers because they didn't hear about it. But when you use the term disbeliever, it means someone who heard the message and deliberately rejected it, refused to accept it. Okay? Are all people who died as non-Muslims disbelievers? No. Some were non-believers and their destiny is only known to Allah in the light of the statement in the 15th ayah of Surah Al-Isra, we will not punish until we have sent a messenger. But even if you say, all right, somebody heard the message of Islam correctly and refused to become a Muslim, is it possible to call him or her disbeliever? Yes, you could. But be careful again that when you say disbeliever, to specify disbeliever in what? A person who remained Christian or Jew, he is a disbeliever not in God, because they believe in God, not in revelation, not in the core teaching of the prophets or at least the moral teaching and basic things. They are basically disbelievers. And that's serious enough, but we have to be precise. Disbelievers in the last form of Islam that Allah required all mankind to accept through his universal and final prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm not saying it's light, it's, but again, it is up to Allah to hold people for their beliefs and correctness in the day of judgment. But then they say, okay, maybe you're right. And sometimes I don't know whether we can find some term because usually even people take the term disbelievers in a negative sense, even though it's literally correct, but it's open to see whether um, other gentle term can be used without watering down the line between Iman uh, and Kufr. But then they come to another objection. They say, but Islam actually teaches or advocates hatred and no cordial relationship with non-Muslims. They say, how is that? Where is that? Oh, they say in the Quran, in Surah 5, for example, Surah Al-Ma'idah, <coughs> it says, addressing Muslims, لا تتخذوا اليهود والنصارى أولياء And they translated, oh, Muslim believers don't take Jews and Christians as friends. That's an error of translation to start with. More than one error. First, translation. The word awliya is more than friendship. Awliya means to look for defense and security in those who are, uh, with those who are not Muslims. And that should not offend anyone. All it says is that Muslims should be united, should have their mutual defense rather than defending on their own enemies to defend them. Because ultimately their objective would not be to defend Muslims but to swallow Muslims one after the other. So this is a, a, a glaring mistranslation. And I was surprised to see uh, on one of the programs I was watching, very famous in North America on the CNN, the Larry King Live, when uh, a learned Jewish rabbi appeared there and uh, he said, oh, but there is violence also in the Quran. He says, Larry King, who is a Jew himself even, but as a journalist, he has to tell him, like what? All he said, the Quran says, don't take Jews and Christians for friends. That's a very famous and well-learned rabbi and a professor. I wonder whether he knew it or knew and tried to hide it. He said because the Quran said don't take Jews and Christians for friends. But even then Larry King responded back and he said, but it didn't say kill them. There's no basis for violence even if, you, if I don't want to be your friend, it doesn't mean that I have to kill you because of this. But the error even is originally in the translation of the term itself. And if you examine the ayat in the Quran that prohibit Muslim from taking non-Muslims as protectors, friends, protectors, not just friends, you'll find that it appears in negative context. In the context of Muslims who, have, who are weak in faith, and there were incidents for that at the time of the Prophet ﷺ when Islam's victory was not clear, 
So some people try to keep cozy relationship with both camps at the time of war, which is not appropriate. In some cases, it describes those with whom we should not look for protection. وَإِذَا قُمْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ اتَّخَذُوهَا هُزُوًا وَلَعْبَ Those, when you stand in your prayer, they mock at you. Is there any sensible person who is not Muslim even, who would say that Muslims are obligated to take for their protectors people who are mocking at their religion? That's insane to expect. There is no offense to anyone that the Quran speak about awliya. But friendship, the Quran went beyond friendship. When a Muslim is allowed to live with a Christian or Jewish wife, a woman of the people of the book, and the Quran teaches him to live with her in peace, love and compassion, isn't that even more intimate than friendship? And the ayahs that were cited in Surah 60, Tabarruhum, Birr, which involves all this beautiful meaning of cordial relationships so long as they're not aggressive or oppressive against you. How come? See, again, the question of taking things out of the broader context of the Quran, as we mentioned in the categories of errors earlier. But then they come back, the most famous couple of things that they say. They say, but the Quran gives license. I heard it a lot and see it, seen a lot in print. Islam gives license to its adherents in their religious fanaticism to kill those who refuse Islam. W what's the evidence? They say the Quran say, kill the unbelievers wherever you find them. The most, uh, the most perfect example of cut and paste. The Quran says, kill the unbelievers and some of them, by the way, to instigate hatred against Islam and Muslim. You know what they do? Kill the unbelievers and then between brackets, including Jews and Christians. Or sometimes Jews and Christians, or whatever you find them. And say, this is exactly, this is exactly what some people or some Muslims have been giving fatwas that any non-believer, military or otherwise, civilian, can be killed anywhere, no question asked. See, th that's exactly the explanation. It is rooted. All that violence is rooted in the Quran itself. Number one. If a person were just to look at the full ayah even to start with. Number one, it says, فَاقْتُلُوا الْمُشْرِكِينَ And the word mushrikeen has been made distinct in the Quran from people of the book. Evidence, Surah Al-Bayyana, Surah number 98 in the beginning, لَمْ يَكُنِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ مُنْفَكِينَ There is the broad term of kafir, those who chose not to accept Islam. Okay? rejected the message of the Prophet ﷺ, which is their privilege their, and their responsibility as well. But it makes distinction under the broad kafir, people of the book, and mushrik. And mushrik here meant the Meccan pagan Arabs. So there you go, the brackets that distort the meanings. Secondly, it says even in the very beginning, فَإِذًا سَلَخَ الْأَشْهُرُ الْحُرُمْ Oh, it says when the sacred month ended, then obviously if a person were just to look at the full ayah even to start with number one it says فَاقْتُلُوا الْمُشْرِكِينَ and the word mushrikeen has been made distinct in the Quran from people of the book evidence Surah Al-Bayyana Surah number 98 in the beginning لَمْ يَكُنِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ مُنْفَكِينَ there is the broad term of kafir those who chose not to accept Islam okay rejected the message of the Prophet ﷺ, which is their privilege their, and their responsibility as well. But it makes distinction under the broad kafir people of the book and mushrik. And mushrik here meant the Meccan pagan Arabs. So there you go, the brackets that distort the meanings. Secondly, it says even in the very beginning, فَإِذًا سَلَخَ الْأَشْهُرُ الْحُرُمْ Oh, it says when the sacred month ended, then obviously it speaks not as a general statement anywhere, but it's connected with something. So that leads to another question. What is the historical context? The historical context were the pagan Arabs who betrayed Muslims, tortured them, harassed them, killed some of them under torture, fought against them, and even when the Prophet ﷺ had the peace treaty of Hudaybiyah with them, they betrayed that and killed the allies of Muslims. He's speaking about a state of war, not going to the street to find the first non-Muslim to chop their head off. Obviously, the historical context is very relevant. And then, remember when we said also, you have to look at the sectional context. 
This ayah is one of 15 ayahs that deal with the same subject, the first 15 ayahs in Surah Al-Bara'ah. And in the same section, just a few ayahs around, it gives the reason why they should be killed because it says, وَهُمْ بَدَأُوكُمْ أَوَدَ مَرَّةً Because they were the ones who started aggression against you in the first place. It makes exception even for the mushrikeen. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ عَهَدْتُمْ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَنْقُصُوكُمْ شَيْءٍ Even the mushrikeen, not let alone people of the book, who did not betray their treaty with the Muslims, you should complete their term with them and respect it. Once you put it in its proper context, you know that this is not a license to do that. You put it in the context of the whole Qur'an. Why does the Qur'an and Sunnah go out of its own way to ascertain and protect the rights of religious minorities living under Muslim authority if the only way to deal with them is chop their head off?